Hello, everybody, and welcome to the School of Engineering and Center for Energy Transition joint seminar today by Tom Baxter called Overselling Hydrogen in the UK. This promises to be a, a really, really interesting talk today. Uh, hydrogen is obviously a topic which has a lot of interest out there. It seems to be everywhere in the debates and discussions around energy transition. Uh, the UK government certainly featured hydrogen centrally in its 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution with a, a forecast of producing five gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen by 2030. And, and closer to home, the Scottish government released just before Christmas its hydrogen policy statement. But a big question is, is hydrogen up to the task? And what are the alternative options? Uh, around hydrogen and other forms of a versatile fuel for storage and energy generation. This is going to be a really interesting seminar exploring some of these questions and I'd like to now hand over to uh, Alfonso Martinez Philip from the School of Engineering to introduce our speaker and we really look forward to this fascinating talk today. So hi everyone and welcome and thank you for coming. First of all, for joining today. As uh, my colleague Kevis was uh, mentioning, I'm Alf Martinez Felipe and I am the co-champion of the hydrogen economies theme in the in the Center for Energy Transition and um, also following up on the interest on, on hydrogen across the country and, and I would say across the world. In Aberdeen, we are pushing forward a lot of initiatives to, to get hydrogen moving. Uh, some of those include, for example, the responses that we have to the government inquire about hydrogen capabilities, but also some research in terms of hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, some EU uh, proposals as well to get uh, utilization and production of hydrogen to, uh, let's say, uh, commercial levels and uh, also international projects with colleagues, for example, in, in Malaysia to produce uh, or to prepare some hydrogen labs over there to store hydrogen underground with colleagues from engineering too. And uh, we also have the, the team of students called Prototau uh, who are well, who have already built the first version of, uh, of a racing car, which is a very small car actually, uh, fueled by using fuel cells. And, um, and as we, we teach courses as well on energy conversion and storage uh, where we deal with the hydrogen topic and, and we, we deal, as Davis was mentioning, with different possibilities for, for energy vectors and, and how we can make this in a most efficient way possible. So it's a really lively, lively topic and, uh, and Aberdeen is becoming a, a definitely one of these hubs in the UK when, when you can see a lot of things going on with, uh, for example, the double deckers in, in the city, uh, uh, buses that have been running our streets for now probably six years now, uh, fuel, uh, using fuel cells, uh, using hydrogen and the Kitty Plaster refilling the station. This is using hydrogen from electrolysis of water. We got a, an enormous potential as well uh, from biomass uh, to produce hydrogen uh, using renewable sources. And so all in all, a lot of opportunities and uh, but also a lot of technical aspects to consider. And that's why, uh, well, we are delighted to have here today uh, some uh, good old friend, I would say, from, from the University and the School of Engineering, uh, who is my, well, my former colleague, Tom Baxter, is a chemical engineering consultant. And again, uh, I would like to thank him for, for giving us the opportunity to have this, uh, what I think is going to be a very fruitful and interesting discussion. So Tom Baxter, uh, graduated from Starclyde uh, in 1975, is a, BC, a BSc in chemical engineering with first class honors and a fellow of the ICME. And he started uh, his career with ICI Petrochemicals uh, moving uh, moved to find chemicals with the Swiss company uh, Sibakili before taking a position as a process engineer in 1980 with BNOC, the British National Oil Corporation, then uh, ended up becoming BP. So here uh, he worked as an uh, operations engineer, development engineer and research manager. Later on in 1991, he left BP and joined Ultra Consultants as a technical manager and he accepted a position as a technical director uh, with Genesis in 1998, becoming the Aberdeen Business Unit Director in 2005. Then he returned 
uh, to his role as a technical director in 2010, together with a position as a senior fellow in the chemical engineer department at the University of Aberdeen. That's where our uh, paths somehow cross, although I joined the, the university five years later. Um, and there, or here, he helped establish uh, our chemical and materials engineering group, where uh, which is uh, co-organizing this, this seminar. And it was actually, uh, let's say, the germ of the, of the idea for this uh, talk today. And since uh, 2003, he has been a visitor professor of chemical engineering in the Strathclyde University, Salma Mater, and currently is a chemical engineering consultant uh, providing greenhouse gas reduction expertise. So I think it's a fantastic match for this talk, and he's going to give us a very broad idea and picture of uh, some controversial points on hydrogen and also their energy vector. So I think with further ado, I will just give the, the floor to my colleague Tom Baxter, and, um, and I hope that all enjoy the, the conversation, of course, after you can, I think you have a Q&I panel in which you can send your, your questions. Um, I will moderate that, that panel as well as the, the further question session. So we will pick up your questions. If you like one of the questions already, you can probably uh, give a thumb up uh, uh, sign so that there are no repeating questions. And then I will try to prioritize those questions which are more interesting. I'm pretty sure that we'll have time for everyone to participate and, and join in this uh, lively debate. So, Tom, it's all, all over to you. So, th this is the um, UK uh, government's um, emissions figures and metric or million tons CO2 equivalent. And these numbers are for 2018. Yeah. So, the total um, CO2 equivalent uh, uh, emitted from uh, UK territory was 450 million tonnes. And you can see the bar charts here and the, uh, the sort of big ticket items, yeah. So everything I, I've, I'll use, um, you can see a reference at the bottom, so you, you can chase that reference if you're, um, if you're interested. Also to, to frame my thoughts, um, I've used the European Union um, energy strategy. The UK is yet to produce a full strategy, but I, I think um, the European Union one is, uh, is first class. So the, the three main tenets are um, energy efficiency at the core, um, electrification for, for space heating, uh, low temperature industrial processes, etc., electric vehicles, and using hydrogen and other low carbon fuels where direct heating or electrification are not feasible. And not feasible is not technically feasible or not commercially attractive. Also, um, to, to, to shape my thinking was um, the ICME's position in climate change. So I'm obviously a member of the ICME and they really push systems thinking. Don't just look at in isolation, look at the complete holistic system. And that's uh, embedded in uh, my thinking that you're going to see here. So well, we all know the, 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 the what's said about hydrogen. Yeah, most common element in the universe. Uh, if you, it produces electricity and water, can be stored, etc., etc. Yeah. So if you look at hydrogen at face value, you'll say, well, what's not to like about this? It, it looks great. And indeed, a couple of years ago, I was completely seduced by hydrogen as a, a clear way forward. And then as I started to peel back the, the technologies and uh, you know get, get further and further into it, I, I really changed my views and, and you'll see that uh, as the talk progresses. So firstly, uh, let's talk a little bit about the properties of hydrogen. Um, and one that, that's uh, often talked about is hydrogen as, is about two and a half times the, um, the mass um, energy density than methane. Yeah, the, the, the hydrocarbon we commonly burn at the moment. So that, that, that looks very good. But however, if you turn it over to its energy volume density, so if we now go from megajoule from per kilogram to cubic metre, it now becomes about a sixth of that of kerosene or aviation fuel. So we need a lot more volume uh, than, uh, than um, uh, current um, fuels. And, and that could be very important, for example, uh, for aviation or for storage. 
also, um, if you look at moving hydrogen compared to methane and the, the common um, polytropic head expression, uh, um, common nomenclature applied, we can see the polytropic heads influenced by the molecular weight. Now, hydrogen is very low, as we know, it's two, so that will push the polytropic head way high for a given uh, compression ratio. And that in turn means much more work done on the fluid. We, we need to supply much more power to move um, the same calorific value of hydrogen as we do as methane. So here I've done the calcs. Um, we need to move 2.4 times the mass of hydrogen to get the same heat content um, out of the compressor. The uh, hydrogen compressor is uh, pretty precise here, almost 600 kilowatts. The methane compressor is uh, 165. So we need about three and a half times the power to move hydrogen than we do to move methane. Clearly significant for gas distribution systems if we're using hydrogen. Hydrogen at the moment um, worldwide is around 70 million uh, um, tonnes of hydrogen per year, and that accounts for about uh, 6% of global natural gas usage and 2% of, of coal usage. And it's a very significant um, carbon, it has a very significant carbon footprint in its own right without moving hydrogen for any further forward. Um, uh, current production has a significant carbon footprint. And just some statistics down here. And the one I quite liked was um, the CO2 equivalent from hydrogen production of Indonesia and United Kingdom combined, all their emissions combined for these two nations is the same as hydrogen production. And again, in terms of energy, the total annual production of hydrogen is bigger than the primary energy supply from Germany. The current biggest users are chemicals, and the biggest in there is uh, through ammonia for fertilizers. Uh, also significant is, um, is in refining, where we hydrotreat and hydrocrack uh, with hydrogen. So for me at the moment, if we're going to get after um, cutting hydrogen emissions, we have to start with what we're doing now. Yeah. So um, as I said, I'll use this as a focus. So I'm going to get after space heating. Yeah, a big, big um, um, carbon emitter in, in the UK. So space heating for business premises, for residential premises, and it's actually in here as well for public premises. So this is hospitals and libraries and uh, other, other um, um, uh, government offices. So, so how do we heat it at the moment? So generally in the UK, offshore gas comes in, uh, we, we treat it, yeah. So we produce natural gas, uh, essentially methane, which we burn uh, at uh, the numbers I got from uh, UK Power were 3.8 kilowatts uh, uh, pence per kilowatt hour. And if we go through the other route, so take natural gas, we burn it, uh, we produce the electricity, that's about 14 pence per kilowatt hour. So we've got a huge uh, difference here. And no surprise that most uh, uh, buildings at the moment are heated by gas with that price differential. So let's take this forward. I'm uh, a bit techy, but um, uh, um, so apologies for, for some of you, but you've got one of these guys working in reverse in your fridge. It's the heat pump, yeah. So Y axis is pressure, we've got uh, energy, enthalpy, kilojoules per kilogram on the X axis, and we've got a, a typical um, fluid that we'd use on in a heat pump here. Um, so all liquid, between the arc, we've got liquid and vapour, and as we move further out, we've got all vapour. The green lines are isotherms, lines of constant temperature, yeah, and the black lines are lines of constant entropy. So let's move through a cycle. Um, so four to one, we're adding enthalpy, we're adding heat, and this is heat we're, we're taking from the ground or we're taking from the air, or as we've seen in my hometown in Clydebank, we're taking from a river, yeah. We take heat from a low temperature source. We then use that heat to vaporize the, the working fluid in the heat pump. We then compress it, yeah. So to compress it, we put energy in. Now, as we compress it, as you'll see across the isotherms, so we get a warm fluid. So we now use that warm vapour and dump that heat, that enthalpy, into the building. So what we can do is upgrade the heat. That difference there, 
of, of the heat that we get out of the heat pump um, compared to the heat that we put in from the compressor is called the coefficient of performance. So we get a lot more heat out than the power we put in, and a typical number might be around three to one. So this is a thermodynamic gift. For every kilowatt hour of electricity, I can put three kilowatt hours of heat into a property. Fantastic. So let, let's have a look. If we go the hydrogen route into a property, so we, we've got um, green hydrogen or green electricity, which we electrolyze, uh, which has got an efficiency of 75%. So we lose um, 25 watts in that transformation. We then treat it and compress it, and we take it into the house, about maybe um, um, close to 10% losses there. And again, as we burn it and a burner, we'll lose about 10% of the heat. So all of that 162 watts appears in the house or the building. If we go direct electrification, 100 watts um, green energy, transmission losses take it down to 95. We then use the heat pump with a 3 to 1 upgrade and we can get 280 watts into the house that are building. The, 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 this, to me, thermodynamically, um, is definitely the way to go, electrification of, um, of space heating. So if, if we move forward now, and I have never seen this analysis done, um, if you look at the renewable capacity, yeah, we'll need four, four or five times more for a kilowatt hour into the, 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 the building than we do if um, we use um, uh, electrification. Now, that is electricity, yeah, that we're going to use here, yeah, going to the house. How can the cost of uh, hydrogen, which is derived from electricity, be less than the cost of, of the source electricity? And and that I want to see a lot of um, of people predicting the price of hydrogen. I'm not seeing what the predicted comparative price when we go forward of of electricity. But I can't see how over an annual average basis hydrogen is going to possibly be cheaper than electricity. And that completely switches from where we are now, where gas is a quarter the price of electricity. And and this will really. Um, push the, I, I believe, the heat pump into a different, um, um, a different sphere in terms of um, justifying um, a heat pump. Just um, so, some uh, work with the Carbon Trust, they're looking at heat pump retrofit in London, they're, they're looking at um, uh, the old Victorian buildings, yeah, and the, the heat pumps are appearing um, significantly, and they're predicting that uh, it will be cost effective with this price differential. Now, if, if, if it's cost effective there, when you look at the holistic life cycle cost of um, electricity um, uh, uh, on a heat pump or natural gas, then it's going to look much better as, I, as I'm repeating myself as we move forward with green hydrogen. I hear a lot, oh, heat pumps don't work. Uh, they don't work when it gets cold, yeah. So let, let's look at who's using heat pumps in Europe and 25% of the population in the coldest countries in Europe um, are using heat pumps, albeit the, the housing stock's in a better position there. But heat pumps work, there's absolutely no doubt about it. They probably don't work because of poor installation, because of poor advice. And I'm not sure that the heat pump installers in the UK have, have the understanding of the, the, uh, the thermodynamics and the, the heat losses to, um, to be appropriately um, designing these, um, uh, these units for the UK household. And we all see this. Hydrogen revolution is a marvellous chance for Britain if it does not throw away the prize. Um, Ambrose Evans Pritchard in the Telegraph, I think, yeah. Now, it may be a prize for big industry, but is it a prize for the UK consumer? Uh, are, are those two aligned? I don't think so. And I'd much rather see a prize for myself as a UK consumer than a prize for big finance or big industry. So once again, let, let's look at the green route. We've got wind turbines and solar panels, electricity, electrolyzers. We make hydrogen, we treat hydrogen, we get it to the house. So who's this going to benefit? Well, it'll allow you to sell more turbines and panels in the electrified route because of all the losses that you've got. 
um, we'll use the existing gas infrastructure. So if I'm a gas supplier like um, SGN, I'm going to promote hydrogen. I'm not going to promote heat pumps. Yeah, um, I'll sell more electricity. Um, for a, at least the next decade, hydrogen will be fossil derived. So if I'm a fossil company, quite rightly, understandably, I'm going to produce hydrogen. And if I'm um, a boiler uh, manufacturer like uh, Bosch or Baxi, I'm going to produce, I'm going to promote hydrogen as well. I'm going to sell more electrolyzers. Yeah. So if I'm a BOC under the Lindy Group, um, the, the biggest uh, hydrogen producer, I'm interested in this. Is it best for um, you can consumer, let's see. So here's the all parties parliamentary group on hydrogen. Yeah, so they, they, they've published uh, their, their hydrogen view. Uh, look at the sponsors, gas boiler people, network uh, gas providers and fossil companies. Is it any surprise that this all parties parliamentary group, when it's funded and sponsored by these guys, doesn't come up with a rose-tinted view of hydrogen. And I'll give you, I've, I, I've seen numerous uh, places where hydrogen is overhyped in this um, in this document. Yeah. Uh, what, what I'll show you is, um, so that there's a, you won't be able to read it, but the big number here is 89 billion of benefit to the customer of going to green hydrogen. So I thought, I'll, I'll try that number down. So I went to the source, which was the Energy Networks Association cost to the consumer for hydrogen. I, I sourced the information and unabated, that's um, as we do with hydrogen at the moment, so natural gas reforming basically, the, the total cost is 1390 billion pounds. If we go the net zero route, so first of all, uh, going green hydrogen and blue uh, with some um, uh, natural gas, 1301, so if I take that from that, I get 89 billion. Now that from that 89 billion is 6% accuracy. How on earth can you predict with a 6% cost accuracy to 2050? It's a nonsense. It, I, I could change the assumptions made here and flip that number over quite, quite readily. To all intents and purposes, these are the same number, uh, bearing in mind the possible accuracy you can have in that assessment. Um, here's the, the Hydrogen Task Force, another influential group. It, it's quite busy, but um, there it says a GVA of 18 billion to 2035. Yeah, 18 billion, again, a big number. So we get these headlines, uh, hydrogen worth 18 billion. 5 million heat pumps by 2035 at 10,000 pounds each. I can write a headline, heat pumps worth 50 billion to the UK economy and lower heating bills. It, it, it's very biased. It's accurate reporting, but it's out of context. There's no comparison. Yeah. So if you look at hydrogen in isolation, you can present a very good story. But the real comparison or the real story is a comparative holistic analysis with the competing options. Now, this is a, a paper um, in a, a very well respected journal by very well respected um, academics. And their conclusion is incumbents are overselling green gas to policymakers in order to protect their interests and detract from the importance and value of electrification. And they've done a completely scientific uh, uh, basis for that. So if you're interested, get after Science Direct and have a look at this, what I think is an absolutely excellent paper. And what, what I will repeat is, if I was a fossil company, I would be promoting hydrogen. I work for fossil companies, yeah. And you look after your own business. That That's perfectly natural. I would say I'm not, if I'm a fossil company or a gas grid operator, I'm not going to promote electrification. And we will all look to Germany, yeah. So here's um, a German quote that I saw uh, um, just, I think it was just last week, no, 2nd of um, February. Federal government of Germany, hydrogen currently not an option in the heat market. Yeah. I look at the IKME, emissions reductions must start now. So if we're going to get after getting um, uh, uh, reduced uh, carbon footprint, hydrogen isn't the way to go, certainly for, for heating. We, we have the solution in the heat pumps and electrification and well-insulated housing. 
The UK government have said they won't uh, they won't mandate, um, as they say, world class efficiency standards in housing until 2025. Why? I don't know why. Let's do it now. So uh, for space heating, I, I, I really see the case for hydrogen being extremely weak. For transport, which is the biggest single sector, yeah, let's have a look at that. So if, if we go into the Department for Transport um, information on the million tonnes of CO2 equivalent uh, produced in the UK, so we've got a timeline here up almost to the day, you see it's absolutely dominated by passenger cars, by light vans, and then heavy goods vehicles. Bus and rail are, are really very, very small. So while every effort to reduce CO2 uh, is, is to be welcome, focusing on this area is the wrong end of the stick. We really ha have to get after passenger cars, light vans and heavy good vehicles. So if, if we look at the, the, the competition here, so if we uh, um, use the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle, we have two energy vectors to get through to get um, kilowatts onto the wheels. Yeah. So if we've got 100 watts of um, um, source energy, let's say it's green energy, we uh, lo lose 25 uh, generating hydrogen. Uh, getting the hydrogen to the filling station, we, we lose another 10% or so, uh, and then we have to compress it at the filling station, maybe up to 700 bar to get it into the um, into the tanks. We then, once it's in the car, have to reconvert it back to electricity. So the fuel cell conversion will be about 60%, and then we'll get the drivetrain losses, uh, which gets us to around 38 watts of the original 100. Now go through the battery electric vehicle with no transition. Energy, electricity to electricity to electricity to electricity. Uh, and we don't have the big kick downs that we get from the vector transitions. So 100 watts becomes 80 watts on the wheels, double the, uh, um, the efficiency or half the energy requirement of the, uh, the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle for passenger cars. Yeah, and th th these numbers have been verified by all the car manufacturers. Here's a quote from BMW, the overall efficiency is, yeah. That's really, really important, yeah. Now, if you look at what's happening in the market, look at what Volkswagen is, Volkswagen is saying. The conclusion is key, key yeah, clear. Everything speaks in favour of the battery. GM, General Motors, we want to put everyone in an electric vehicle. Bloomberg, hydrogen can play a valuable role in heavy haulage, but for the bulk of the car, bus and light truck market, um, battery's the way to go. Um, a few months back, Daimler, um, um, that they uh, pulled um, the hydrogen fuel cell um, uh, development work for the passenger car. I saw this and um, it was a comparison uh, by a, a company called uh, High Mobility, sponsored by the usual suspects, and it said a fuel cell electric vehicle has 2.7 grams per kilo kilometre of uh, CO2 emissions, whereas a battery electric vehicle has 20.9. Now, for me, that didn't pass the sniff test. So I went to the source of th those numbers. And what I found was for the fuel cell electric vehicle, they assumed the hydrogen had produ been produced by green energy. For the battery electric vehicle, they assumed the electricity had been produced by fossil burning. A completely distorted assumption that hyped up the hydrogen fuel cell. I, I see a number of times, a number of occasions where this hydrogen hype, um, um, whilst on the face of it, that was true. But until you until you uh, get into the, the, the basis, um, it, it's flawed. It, 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 it's an it's a unbalanced picture. I mentioned trains. So trials of the UK first um, hydrogen train, so this is the UK government, talks about a revolution. Scotland's revolution on trains, BOC, uh, the biggest hydrogen producer um, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the UK, uh, under the Lindy Group, the biggest, probably the biggest hydrogen producer worldwide. So they're talking about a revolution. So I went off to look at uh, the UK's network rail, what they were saying about hydrogen. So they've electrified everything bar 15 and a half thousand um, kilometres of track. Their cost benefit analysis says get after about 12,000 
um, using electricity, maybe 900 using hydrogen. What revolution is this? It's it, again, it's just um, overblown hype. Now, um, let's look at batteries and the, the de battery development with time has been uh, pretty, pretty um, um, impressive. So first of all, we've got range here with time and you can see the range increasing. Yeah. So and that's one of the benefits often uh, cited for hydrogen is it's got a, a, a bigger range. Uh, battery prices keep falling. Yeah, so we're seeing batteries. So courtesy of Bloomberg, you can look at all these numbers up in Bloomberg and F. And importantly, well, battery energy density is increasing. So per kilowatt hour you're getting out the battery, uh, per kilogram, that's getting better and better and better. Now that's really important for trucks, heavy trucks. Now heavy trucks, um, although the to produce electricity is half that of hydrogen in terms of uh, energy requirements, when you put a big battery into the truck, then the operational efficiency of the truck drops, hence the interest in hydrogen for, for trucking. But just extrapolate that hydrogen um, density curve. And for sure, I'm absolutely convinced that the, the, the truck market will, will erode uh, in favour of, of batteries. And indeed, if you look at, um, um, Scania announced this within the, the, the last couple of weeks, battery versus hydrogen, they, they, they've dropped their hydrogen for, for, for trucks. The biggest trucking uh, truck manufacturer, I think, in Europe, and they're going off, uh, they're only going um, to batteries. I don't see in any of the policies or part strategies that I've seen anyone taking account of battery developments. They're happy to take account of um, green hydrogen reducing in price, but the, no one that I've seen um, extrapolates where we think we're going with batteries and drop that into the trucking market. So um, if you um, mention batteries, so people are immediately on you for lithium and um, and cobalt, yeah. So, you know, all the environmental damage that's done. But more and more now, we're designing batteries with recycling in mind, yeah. So that the components aren't thrown away, yeah. And um, we, we have problems with wind turbine blades, we have problems with um, solar panels. Nothing's perfect, but a battery is far much better than burning fossil fuels. Yeah, it does have drawbacks. Generally, every engineering endeavor that we do has drawbacks. Yeah, and if you look at um, uh, platinum, which is a big part of a, a fuel cell, um, and we look there. Um, so here's a, a, a lot of platinum comes from the African mines. Reports said platinum mines have serious health risks and safety risks. Yeah, and uh, certainly out of context, um, whilst I was just uh, having a look at, um, I was looking at lithium, um, th this popped up. So geothermal project, um, lithium extraction uh, from um, uh, geothermal brains, the, 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 the have a high lithium content. So wouldn't it be neat if, neat if we could extract the lithium from the brain and get energy, geothermal energy at the same time? If we do go the electrification of transport, obviously the refineries are working less. They've got less fossil fuel uh, to make, less um, gasoline, less uh, diesel to make. So we get a double whammy, the, the refinery carbon footprint. So this again is the government figures. Um, this 13.1 million tonnes uh, per year is a, is a, will reduce. So we get this um, uh, consequential benefit as well of uh, electrification. We might think about e-fuels, so we're going to make a synthetic fuel. For example, we might make um, um, an e-fuel, uh, uh, an aviation fuel. Yeah, so we um, we elect, uh, get electricity, green electricity, we electrify, we source carbon. And although the jury's out for me, uh, many, um, including the Royal Society of Chemistry, are talking about um, direct air capture. So this would be um, capturing carbon from the air. We then have carbon and hydrogen that we fish our crops to an e-fuel. Yeah. So um, here again, the Royal Society, if we do go an e-fuel route, so this is diesel, 
um, the diesel uh, e-fuel route. Th there's their figure for battery 69. I, I was up near 80. The fuel cell was 26. I was up near 38. But again, the figures are about double or half. Yeah, th th their difference is even more. But we do take another penalty if we go for an e-fuel from capturing the carbon. Yeah. But I have to check myself, is every kilowatt hour precious? Perhaps not. And perhaps for aviation, we have to be thinking um, uh, maybe every kilowatt hour isn't precious. And this might be a route through to, um, to, to aviation fuels, as would um, perhaps um, uh, uh, biofuels. Now, again, often mentioned is decarbonising heavy industry and the hard to abate sectors being cement and steel. So let's have a look at worldwide figures. Steel worldwide is 3.3 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. Um, so that's 9% of annual greenhouse gases, a really big number. Similarly, cement, a really big number, yeah. So, you know, focus here, worldwide, is 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 interesting yeah it's, it's, it's material now let's look at steel and cement in the uk so again go back to the duke's figures there's cement so if i add up cement that sums to just over uh, what is it uh what 1.4 1.5 percent not seven percent look at steel um two percent there's a little bit of steel here um so that's yeah just over two percent so Steel and cement in the UK, what I'm talking about are minor players, for example, compared to Germany. Again, albeit we should be getting after it, it's not a big ticket item in the context of the UK. And we can electrify a lot of heating. We don't have to go the hydrogen route. Yeah. And um, so here, I've uh, stolen this from McKinsey. Yeah, the reference is down here. And the electrification of heat basically ohmic or uh, uh, resistive heating. We can get up to 1000 degrees centigrade there. And that gets after reforming. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite with them. I think there's a smaller percentage here, but we can electrify a lot of um, industrial heating and we can use the heat pump again and upgrade the electrical kilowatt hours to, um, um, to heat, to kilowatt hours for heat and uh, the, uh, the US Department of Energy have, have issued a very interesting report looking at the applications for um, heat pumps for industrial usage. Now, uh, moving on again to another topic, and that is um, seasonal variations in dispatchable energy. So at the moment, I took the last four years of um, uh, the UK energy supply. So blue is gas, red is electricity, uh, green is transport and the total. So you see transport is relatively flat seasonally. We, we use our cars as much as we do uh, summer as in winter. Uh, but the big peak is um, gas, yeah. And that results in uh, an energy um, uh, peak and trough for the UK of around 3,000 gigawatt hours per day. Now that's a big, uh, that's a big peak. And, and that leads people into saying that, well, gas provides four times more energy than electricity. That's too much to allow for electrified replacement. Let, let, let's hold that and we'll now move on and let's pretend that the UK has been electrified over these uh, uh, four years. And what you'll see is this. So if you electrify gas with heat pumps, we, we have a third of the electricity uh, required. So whereas the blue line is gas this time, uh, uh, previously that was up here with uh, much bigger peaks and, peaks and troughs, it drops down. Transport drops down because the battery is much more efficient than, uh, than fossil fuels. And um, I've just left current electricity uh, supply as is. So that results in this peak and trough so what was 3,000 drops to 900? Now that's much more manageable than, um, than uh, where we are today if we electrify. Uh, if we go the hydrogen route, we'll be back up here. So, but we seem to have accepted hydrogen storage as the only solution for seasonal variation and, um, and um, dispatchable energy, but what we could do, and I've never seen the analysis of SERPs and SERPs 
uh, a comparative study. What we could do for the times that we, we can't supply uh, enough renewable energy, the wind isn't blowing or the, uh, the sun isn't shining, is accept short term emissions from uh, uh, gas power stations. We could tie CCS onto gas power stations and now we've got low carbon electricity. We could um, do the same with BEX, which is uh, carbon negative. We can store energy thermally uh, and batteries, hydrogen. We can use nu nuclear because we can import to, to make up. We've got biofuels, we've got e-fuels, we've got tidal, we've got geothermal. So I'm not saying that any one of those would work, but in combination, uh, they, they could well be a solution that is better than, um, than hydrogen. And the evidence for me just isn't there. Many people have just jumped to the left hand side without um, doing the proper analysis. Just another thought or, or closing out, uh, folks, uh, not, not too long to go, I think you'll be pleased to hear, is let's move forward and we've got passive house installation standards. We have a battery in the house. We've got a battery in our car. We've got a smart electrical um, system that's uh, talking to the grid and talking to the batteries. The grid fails. Yeah, if we've got 100 kilowatts here, 100 kilowatts here, the, a, a, a low energy house will take about two kilowatt hours in the winter. Yeah, and the passive house under these circumstances could last about 10 days without grid support. Okay, let's get behind the meter. Now, um, again, moving on, I, I mentioned costs, seen lots of costs of, on hydrogen, but not the cost of future green electricity. So here we have um, the most recent cost figures that I've seen and they've come from the, the Scottish Government and it was data produced by Arup that you can find down here. So here's the timeline uh, up to 2050. Remember Scotland wants to be um, uh, uh, net zero by 2045. Um, the blue, or maybe this is tartan carbon, which is um, uh, blue carbon so we're reforming with carbon capture will be cheaper and the earliest parity i'm seeing so this is the range is around 2034. the midpoint parity looks about 2050 so we, we might not get there by 2045 in, in uh, the scottish um the scottish ambitions so here are we building reformers with carbon capture, reformers with carbon capture, and then maybe stop. No, we won't. Yeah, these plants have all been built. We're, go we're going to continue with them. Yeah, I, I, I really don't think this forward thinking um, hydrogen um, economy has been uh, fully thought through. Now, let's let's put those two together. So what we're saying for the 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 um, the for the next decade or so, it will be reforming plus CCS. So we get natural gas, we reform, we tag on a CCS plant, we treat and compress, and we send the hydrogen off. The, um, the comparator for me is natural gas still. We've got all the infrastructure there, we've got gas storage, we, we know we can do that. So we have a combined heat and power power station, which we tag CCS onto, and we get electricity and, um, and hot water for district heating from this. Uh, is that better than that? Uh, let me see the evidence. Um, I think it's a, probably the last but one or maybe two. The, the, these are the European Union's um, strategies. Uh, so they've got a whole, uh, they, they set a whole number of pathways for net zero. Uh, the important thing is the, the blue piece here is hydrogen and synth fuels, yeah, for the different pathways and also the actual overall energy use, yeah. So in some pathways, no hydrogen. Uh, some pathways, very little hydrogen, but the maximum usage of hydrogen I'm seeing is about 10, 10%. Interestingly, biomass is a bigger percentage for many, um, for many routes. And do we see a biomass um, uh, lobby going on in government? No, we don't. This whole hydrogen thing is, uh, has been overblown. What we need, in my view, is not to think on hydrogen in silos, but we need an integrated UK policy derived by looking at the four big elements, power generation, heat, storage and transport. Don't look at heat pumps in isolation. Look at heat and look at the options that you've got. Do a comparative. 
same with power gen, same with transport, and same with storage. And obviously sitting out here, to my mind, is energy efficiency is, is key. Just use less energy and we'll produce less carbon. Lifestyle is important. Are we prepared to eat less meat? Are we prepared to walk more? Yeah. Are we prepared to put on a sweater and turn the heating down a degree? And of course, planning and funding models. At the moment, the taxation on electricity for societal envi and environmental impact is 10 or 12 times more than it is for gas. That to me is just plainly wrong. It's absolutely wrong as we source more and more of electricity from, um, from renewables. So I won't get through these. These are just a summary of, uh, of, of what you he you've heard. But in summary, I think the case for hydrogen in many, many applications is evidence weak, very evidence weak. Uh, and we're, 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 we're being seduced by hydrogen without doing the, the, the proper holistic analysis. So I'll close it there uh, and I'll hand it over to a chair. Um, uh, I'll, have to, um, I'll mute and then I'll come back in for uh, any questions. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for this uh, very visual um, talk and touching upon many different aspects. Um, I'm going to pass uh, straight away to, to the questions and I may have a couple of my own. Um, so starting with uh, one of the first ones, I don't know if you can see them as well in the Q&I, but I can read them to you. So Derek Sleeman asks, if heat pumps are used in domestic or industrial building, I understand that this will require the building central heating radiators and pipe work to be replaced. What is the projected cost of doing that for all relevant buildings in the UK? It's a mute, very mute, uh, Tom. I, I don't know. The, the number I see is £10,000 per home. For a building, it's going to be more, yes. There's more capital investment involved at the end point, yeah. But you have to look at the holistics of generating the power in the first instance, converting it to hydrogen, uh, shipping that hydrogen, then burning that hydrogen. So just to look at the conversion point, of course, at the end point, is uh, what will give you a distorted picture. Now, what, what I, I'm, um, uh, I, I'm astonished at is why the government doesn't have that figure. It's not for me to produce that figure. It's for it's for the UK government. And how can it um, produce that uh, or produce policy without that number? I, 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 I'm just uh, bemused. Can you still hear me off? Yeah, yes. I, I was just letting you speak. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so, okay. So um, yes, yes. So, uh, uh, it, 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 as an end point, it will cost more. But that that's not where the, the, the complete picture sits. OK, so I got another question from, uh, well, we don't have the name of this uh, person, said, Tom, interesting talk. Could you elaborate further on how electrification is done and how the energy would be stored? And, and this actually is uh, one of the questions I had in mind as well, because one of the um, one of the issues with hydrogen and one of the benefits is the fact that you could eventually store it in a physical way. Uh, well, it's not having, you know, this uh, to, to get the uh, super capacitors and, and large batteries, which are normally pretty heavy. Um, and I guess that this is one of the reasons why the Orkney projects down up, up there in, in the north of Scotland or in, in the islands have been so successful because they have too much electricity to put into the grid. So the question again was if you could elaborate on how electrification is done and how this energy would be stored. Well, th that's the wrong comparison. And as I sh showed you, you, you've got options for energy storage. You've got thermal, yeah. You have got batteries. You've got hydro. You've got uh, you know, you've got permanent source in geothermal. You've got permanent source in tidal. You, 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 your energy could still be fossil fuels, but you um, you, 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 you moderate that or abate it with um, carbon capture. So the, the debate isn't electric storage versus hydrogen, it's hydrogen storage versus the alternatives and not a single alternative. And again, I haven't seen that analysis done. But one of the important issues is that if you electrify, you need to store less. Hmm. You need less dispatchable power. And, that, and, and that's really, really important. So, so to base an argument on current 
um, peaks and troughs, to me, is flawed. Okay, uh, thanks, Tom. I, I have to say that um, I mean, in my, I'm, I think hydrogen economies are probably in the infancy as well. I mean, say, having said that, uh, I, I think you know, hydrogen is going to have to. Um, let's say share the space with other energy vectors and in energy storage situations. And, and I think um, I've been in quite a few conferences where this has been the message that the fact that hydrogen is, is definitely here not to take over everything in every sector on the energy market, but rather be a component that's going to help in, in different situations. So I, I think this is probably as well in line what you're saying. So um, I've got a, an email, well, a question well, from... Well, I, I, I want to say something there. Yeah, I, hear the, I hear the same things on the conferences that I go to, but what screams in my head is show me the evidence. People are just making assertions. Well, I mean... Uh, They're you know, making I, assertions. Uh, the evidence isn't there from what and I've done extensive amount of literature uh, reviews to try and find the evidence. The evidence should be with the UK government. Surely they can produce a compelling case, yeah. Mm -hmm. Surely they can produce a compelling case. I can't see it. I can't see it compared to the alternatives. And if, if someone shows me the evidence, I'll say, yep, I, I accept that. And I'm not saying I'm right, yeah, but I'm saying on, on, the, on the, the, from what I can see and what I can pair out, um, hydrogen has been oversold. Okay, we, we move on with the questions. Um, I don't want to monopolize the, the, the debate here. So Bob uh, Pringle says, uh, my son in, in Shenzhen says that have 16,000 electric buses. So they agree with you. Is there a niche or any niche areas where when hydrogen may play a part of the future? Well, um, I, I, I think and maybe as a reducing agent, so and the really hard to bake parts of iron and steel. Yeah, uh, yes, definitely. We need hydrogen. Hydrogen is needed. We, we can't feed the world if we don't have hydrogen. So we have to abate current um, re reforming processes. Hydrogen might have a role uh, geographically in some areas. Yeah, but um, I, I don't think it's a panacea or has the big um, um, silver bullet status that uh, many commentators seem to give it. OK, we got a, a question here from Alan Price, which has been echoed by different people in the room as well. He says, is it possible that government is interested in hydrogen partly by concern for jobs to be lost in fossil fuel industry? Yeah, the just transition. I think you mentioned that in your in one of, of parts of the question, right, uh, Tom, on when you were talking about oil companies being involved in the hydrogen sector. Well, jobs are always a factor. And again, where's the evidence? If I start insulating houses now and putting in heat pumps, I'm going to generate lots of jobs now. Not, not, not uh, in the design of a reforming plant with uh, carbon capture on it. Yeah, I'll generate some jobs and I'll generate jobs uh, during its operational phase. The, the short answer is I don't know, but my intuition is telling me that I could generate more jobs through electrification than through hydrogen. But again, where's the evidence? I know I sound like a stuck record on this, but where is the evidence for the jobs? Right. And the comparative the evidence, you can look at hydrogen and say, as the Hydrogen Task Force did, here's the number of jobs. And they even predicted the jobs to uh, 2,432. They managed to get that accuracy into it. Again, a nonsense, yeah, uh, that type of accuracy. But you, in isolation, what does that number mean compared to if I were to use another vector to get myself to, um, to net zero? And that's my plea, that comparative holistic analysis, which is missing. Okay, so Ken... And, and I'll keep repeating that, I'm sorry to say. No, no, that's okay. There's uh, Ken Allen says, are there definitive studies which show quantitative comparisons of the life cycle uh, emissions resulting from embracing significant hydrogen in a total energy mix? compared to renewable electricity, existing, like gas, etc. I think this is what you were saying, right? To give a more holistic view. Yeah. So are there definitive studies, definitive studies, which show quantitative comparisons in the life cycle of those emissions? Because I guess that this is in line with the fact that hydrogen in principle 
uh, could be generating only water, for example, in the production of of, uh, of electricity and uh, biofuel cells compared to other fuels, obviously. Well, again, um, but the, the backbone of green hydrogen is electricity. Yeah. That's his backbone. Yeah. So, yep. so um, the, 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 uh, the emissions, um, I, 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 and there's a case in point, you can look at CO2 emissions, but that's not a holistic view. You have to bring in the other characteristics of sustainability, and that's the societal impact and the environmental impact. Yeah, as well as the economic impact. And, and those three things have to be balanced to come up with a, a, a pathway to net zero. Yeah, so uh, emissions is really important, but it's not the only criteria. Well, OK, so um, question from Charles. Will a heat pump uh, domestic, will a heat pump heat domestic water to a heat adequate for usual purposes? Well, of, of course it will, because people are using it at the moment. They're, they're used throughout, well, as you saw, in Norway, 25% have got heat pumps. And there's good work going on at the moment with uh, improved uh, working fluids. They'll actually give you a higher temperature. But generally, they'll give you a, a lower temperature. But of course, it's UA delta T. So if the delta T is slightly lower, increase the area to get that heat into a property. Tevis actually, or colleague Tevis uh, asks a question here and says, with Shell's announcement yesterday, it is going to invest in hydrogen as well as other natural based solutions. How do you think the mayors will approach this issue over the next decade, disrupted or disruptors? Well, I think over the next decade, um, hydrogen it won't be green derived, it will be fossil derived. Yeah. And um, so, so uh, that, that 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 I don't think I'm having a conversation over the next decade. We won't be generating green hydrogen or, or, or in, in any significant numbers compared to the um, the fossil route abated with um, carbon capture. But but equally, I guess if you don't uh, invest in technologies for green hydrogen, I mean, you know, you you never get there as well. I mean, there's well, been well, an increase. It's a, it's a more price in the market as well, right? Um, so if you don't if you don't put the money for investment, then you don't get the money for development. You don't you don't get to increase the efficiencies, and then you don't get back in the price. And this is a some sort of a cycle, right? That you well, don't. I, I want to see the evidence that you can significantly improve on fuel cells. Yeah. I think it'll be marginal. I think improvement on electroly electrolysis will be marginal. We had a few percent out of it. It's not got. There's no. There's no significant step change coming. But I was um, brought up in <laughs> development engineering, where we had to look at options. And one thing you wanted to do first was size the prize. If the technology works, yeah. What's the size of the prize? And I'm not. I'm not seeing that. So why invest a lot in hydrogen? when you can't articulate the price compared to putting your investment in other, other places. So uh, following up with questions, CJ says, uh, can you comment on use of hydrogen carriers, ammonia for fuel in vessels? And do you think it is likely to be the most efficient way to power long distance marine travels, ammonia, other um, vectors, etc.? Well, uh, ammonia, <laughs> I, 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 my, one of my first jobs was on a nitric acid plant uh, where, where we I catalyzed ammonia uh, with the, the air and water. And I, I know what ammonia is like to handle. And it's a pig of a thing. Yeah. Not only is it very flammable, it's very poisonous. Yeah. Uh, if you go the ammonia route, you put in another vector change, uh, which, which really drops efficiency. However, maybe for shipping, that it, it, it might be an answer. Personally, I think uh, biofuels or something that's dropping into existing ship engines is a better option. Yeah. OK, uh, this is one question actually I shared pretty well because uh, it said when it comes to future of transport, particularly personal road vehicles, how significant do you think it is to be able to refuel quickly as we currently do compared to, for example, recharging batteries, which is one of the main uh, 
you know, question when, when you know, the whole debate about uh, recharging vehicles and times, etc., compared to just uh, getting there to the refilling station with your hydrogen pipe and. Um, the, at the moment, you, you can definitely refuel quicker than you can charge a battery, but there, there's already developments moving forward that are getting uh, charge times maybe down to about 10 minutes. Now, if we're going to deliver on net zero, we all have to take some personal responsibility and maybe some personal slight inconvenience. So if I, well, generally I'd be, I'll be charging my car overnight, yeah. But um, if I'm on a lo long run and I have to wait 10 minutes rather than five minutes to, to, for the charge of 15 minutes rather than five, I don't think that's a big price to pay. But it is, it is a time uh, margin that's being eroded and eroded and eroded by uh, battery technology. Yeah, yeah but at, well, I, I can't remember where the name is done now, but uh, I think it's more than minutes, right, to get a full charge. No, I, 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 it'll be about 40 minutes, yeah, at the moment, yeah. Well, I mean, it's definitely more than 10 minutes, but I suppose well, it depends. No, that, that's where it's going. Yeah. If you look at the work um, from Penn State University and others and Tesla, yeah, uh, battery charge times are coming down and coming down. Yeah. Now, I, yeah, uh, if that's really important to you, if that's more important than improving the, the carbon footprint, yeah, and energy efficiency, if, if, um, if that's important, then uh, you make that personal choice. I, I don't think uh, looking forward that is a particularly significant issue. Um, and, and looking at the range increases in batteries as well for passenger cars, which um, you know uh, many are now well over 300 miles and, um, and improving. How often do we do a 300 mile journey? When we go on holiday? Well, well, we take the time. Yeah. Unfortunately, in the last year, we don't go very far anyway. So, OK, well, let's, <laughs> let's, let's move on uh, with some questions. Uh, Kenneth now says or says, uh, where do you see direct hydrogen production? For example, water splitting using uh, oxide, titanium oxide processing, for example. So where is the niche for hydrogen production straight away from the from the from the light? From, I'm not. I'm not too sure what the question is. Sorry. So, so I guess that the question is instead of going through a derived route when you have uh, electricity generated elsewhere, and then you just bring that electricity to an electrolyzer and you get hydrogen out of it. If you could just do it uh, from a photovoltaic plant, for example, you know, photoelectrolysis. Uh -huh. uh, I suppose the question is what what is the the space uh, and and what what is the the perspectives for that for that technology? If you're familiar too. I, I honestly couldn't give an answer there. I mean, well, what I'm reading is, um, you know, it's a, it's a volume issue. You, you can't produce enough hydrogen through the uh, through the bio route. OK, I got a question from Anonymous here. It says evidences will come after further research will be done. So this is probably in line as well with my previous comment on, you know, you need to invest before you can get the, the numbers right. But there's no 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 name, so I don't know who said that. And, and there's no question actually, it's just in the state then. Okay. Um, so great presentation. How we see is hydrogen transportation. Can the existing transport facility from fossil fuel be securely used to transport hydrogen? And I think I can I can just say that uh, you need to repurpose part of the pipelines in here because hydrogen is uh, a much smaller molecule, then there is issues with leaking and, 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 and eventually breaking down the structure, uh, fracturing, etc. Um, and I think it's been proved at the moment that 20%, a mixture between 20% of hydrogen and, and natural gas should be okay for the existing pipeline. But for higher concentrations of hydrogen, you would need to change it into polyethylene and other materials. So I guess that this is probably a question. Uh, answer, David, uh, sorry, our colleague David Dionisi has an interesting question. Do we need a strategy at country global level or should we leave the cost, the consumers, the consumers to decide for themselves whether they want to use the heat pumps or hydrogen boilers to their houses or whether they want to drive a battery electric car or a hydrogen fuel cell car? Consumers will decide based on cost, which include taxes for emissions, technology readiness, level, personal preferences, etc. Tom, so what do you think about this? 
Well, the consumer will always decide. But if if big business and the government um, makes the decision that hydrogen is going into the gas grid at 100 percent, the consumer didn't make that decision. That decision was made for them. So um, consumers, yes, you're given, you're given consumers the can make decisions if they're given all the right information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the moment, I don't think they're getting the appropriate information to make informed uh, decisions. Okay, thank you. I mean, at the moment, I think that the impact of hydrogen technologies in the consumer is very low, just because, again, the technology is still emerging in some cases. And as you say, there are other alternatives as well for heat. What, what technology is emerging? Sorry, again, sorry? What technology is emerging? What technology is, is going to make a significant change to the cost of, of um, to the consumer? Yeah. Well, um, for example, uh, electrolysis technology, uh, photovoltaic technology that can bring um, the production of hydrogen entirely from energy, from renewable energies, biomass um, transformation into hydrogen as well. I mean, it is clear and, and also technology from the point of view of the user, I suppose, because it's uh, something that uh, is still is not available in most of the places. Uh, and, and, and the network, obviously, of uh, delivering hydrogen, I don't think. Right, so we've got a question here from the audience. How can developing countries in Africa boost energy transition in hydrogen implementation? Um, and I think there are uh, quite a few projects at the moment going on in there. I don't know if you have a view for that, Tom. I don't, because if you notice, my my headline talk was in the UK. Yeah, so I I think there are there are some projects over there, and and I think that uh, light from I mean energy from the sun can be a, an interesting approach there to produce electricity, probably, and then turn it into hydrogen. I would probably this is the first way I would look into. Okay, um, we got um, John Scribger saying up oh, our colleague John. And as an alternative of waiting to charge, can arrange battery chains out. Okay, so I think he's suggesting to change batteries instead of just using a recharging operation. If you agree with that, Tom? Yeah, yeah, it's got potential. I, 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 I wrote a paper about that um, some time back. Um, uh, the, the, the Chinese have got a number of swap out stations and they can swap a battery in three minutes, which is very compatible with uh, filling with hydrogen. I see that as too too much of a step for the car manufacturers to align themselves to, uh, to a, you know, a battery design that's um, universal uh, and can be swapped out. So although I was um, initially pretty encouraged with what we've seen the Chinese doing. I've kind of moderated my views now on the practicality of that across a, a range of um, car manufacturers. Of course, in China, it's easier because they've got such a grip on um, on industry. Got a question from Marco. I've heard SNAM is replacing their fleet of gas compressors into electrical turbo compressors that's electrifying their processes. But at the same time, they believe they can be a storage element in the chain of by storing hydrogen in their natural grids. Any comments of this? SNAM is, is a, I guess, an Italian company quite involved in the hydrogen economies as well, in the north of Italy. I, I think I've covered hydrogen storage, yeah. It, 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 it has some compelling features, but, you know, has it been compared with um, the benefits of the, the other options? So I, I, I guess that, that, that's all I can say. And there are other options. And the wrong comparison is hydrogen versus battery storage. You'll always come up with hydrogen then. But if you look at your other options, thermal storage, hydro, et cetera, et cetera, I think you might come up with a, a, a different uh, viewpoint if you use a basket of storage technologies or, <laughs> or on-demand technologies. OK. It's again, this mix of, of different technologies. An, an anonymous question, I think this is the last one. Uh, so personally, I feel that I feel that if the money was put into the research, then a lot of evidence can be produced for or against hydrogen, as the oil and gas industry only came up with amazing innovation and innovative technology once the money started to be poured into the industry. As we are looking for a viable alternative for fossil fuels, using electrical 
electric and hydrogen in cars will work a lot better for long distance than just battery. So it's a, it's a combination of, of technologies here. Well, I think I covered that as well. What, what I was saying, yeah, um, the current battery densities make um, hit the operational efficiency of heavy haulage, but as battery densities improve, that picture will change. And I've already seen it change with Scania, the, the biggest truck manufacturer in, in Europe. But, but I guess that the, the takeaway is if you also improve, um, you know, the, the technology in hydrogen production, then you can be, you know, the same. No. What, 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 you, it, what, we're now trying to challenge thermodynamics here, I think. Yeah. Well, the OK, so well, I don't want to capitalize. <laughs> but we can have a discussion about thermodynamics. Probably how, later. How, how, how are you going to go over Gibbs free energy and electrolyzer? Well, no, definitely not, but I guess well, that... How, how, are you, how are you going to go over fuel cell inefficiencies other than incremental? Well, but the ideal, I mean, the, the ideal efficiency for, for an electrochemical process, which is, you know, similar, I mean, not similar, but very, you know, like I like it between batteries and fuel cells are eventually the same point. This is the Gibbs energy. I would be more concerned, and it's one of the questions actually could be, uh, how does this relate to the second law of thermodynamics when it gets to the heat pumps, for example, and, and you're producing energy at high, you know, high temperature. Because uh, you know, one of the of the of the interesting benefits of using electrochemistry is the fact that you go around the Carnot restriction cycle, if you want. So the second law of, of thermodynamics, which means you can operate at low temperatures, and this is again one of the of the benefits of both fuel cells and batteries. So um, you know, I think they share quite interesting points in terms of efficiency from a thermodynamics point of view. I, 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 I that's a viewpoint. Yeah. Um. I, yep. I don't have a comment. OK, well, the, I think the last question now from the panel uh, is in times where excess electricity is produced, how else could this excess be stored viable, viably? Well, what, what, OK, well, why don't we just sell it to um, across to the continent? Straight electricity across to the continent if we've got surplus. Why don't we use that surplus for direct air capture? So there's, there's, uh, there's, there's other options rather than hydrogen. So what, what are we going to do? We're going to produce green electricity. If we've got too much of it, we convert it to hydrogen. We then process that hydrogen. Uh, we're, I'm seeing it being put into ships and then moved around. And then that's taken to, um, let's say, the continent to be reconverted back perhaps to electricity or heat. It, it, it just doesn't hang together for me when you can just export surplus electricity. Let Germany make their own hydrogen and sell them um, our surplus electricity to do that. OK, so we've got another question here. Well, following from my own research, I can only agree with the dearth of supporting compelling evidence, which would enable far holistic comparisons between hydrogen and other potential energy vectors. So I think this is somehow aligning with your idea that more work needs to be done in terms of comparing the different en energy networks, including hydrogen and other systems, right? Absolutely. I don't know how you can come up with a UK strategy in the absence of that information. Tom, I have a... Um, I got a question from actually uh, one of our team members, which is Wakas from the Prototau team. Um, it says that I would say that pro hydrogen guys aren't trying to change the laws of thermodynamics, but a place to look into is the efficiency for converting hydro to the motor, as there is an option to research and see a better alternative than an off the shell type motor. Uh, so I guess this is just a reflection as well on 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 the discussion through the thermodynamics as well. You've got, you've got the same motor in a hydrogen fuel cell car as you do in a battery car. What do you think, Tom, about uh, hybrid cars, for example, when you actually have batteries and hydrogen as a put? Well, the same way that we have hybrid, uh, you know, cars using. I, I, to me, the, it, why why? I, 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 well, we're not looking for a vaccine here. 
We've got a solution, yeah. Yeah, but electrifying the whole country. I mean, obviously, you know, if you want to export energy, for example, to other parts of the planet or other parts of, of the continent, for example, it's very difficult to do that using just electric electricity or just electrifying, etc. Well, you know, you can probably use as well other components like hydrogen or the same way that, that we are exporting well, natural gas. We export electricity at the moment and we import electricity at the moment. There's large interconnectors coming over from Europe into, into England. And I think we're, we're getting one from Norway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, 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 so there's, there's already a route out for the surplus electricity. Good. So I think we don't have more questions in the, in the panel now. We have just one more just came in now. So nearly all 90% of current storage is pumped water, which is the most viable way to store excess electricity. So. Any comments on this, Tom? Well, I think you know, hydro is a place, probably in the UK, but will be limited by the number of suitable sites. But at the moment, there's a big site in Scotland that's mired in, um, in the planning and consent process above Loch Lochie. And that, that's, um, that's, I think, a one and a half megawatt scheme. And the, in the Scottish context, that's a significant energy producer. So hydro has a place as energy storage, but it, you know, we can't rely on that for um, for prolonged um, periods of slight wind and uh, no sun. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think Tom, thank you very much for all these these questions. Uh, well, just probably the last one, just that the people are are just writing, so it's really good to see the interest. So, if people want to invest into hydrogen, what type should they invest in? High, green, blue, or grey? Tom. Maybe you want to comment on this as well. You have well, a view. Well, I certainly don't invest in grey hydrogen because we're going to be horsing CO2 into the environment. Yeah. For every kilogram of hydrogen, we're going to put nine kilos of uh, CO2 mm -hmm. into the environment. So that's not got an option. Uh, green hydrogen doesn't exist commercially at the moment. So if we want to make hydrogen um, commercially, um, it's blue for the foreseeable um, um, decade or so. I would say I would add to that actually that at the moment, and I think again, going to from all these meetings that we're having and all these seminars during the last couple of years, uh, even even people in the hydrogen world with great interest on in green hydrogen actually are very aware of the need to have uh, blue hydrogen as a component during the transition towards a, a complete potentially green hydrogen economy. So I think the the answer would be that you probably need to do both. But again, this is uh, this is the reason why there are so many European projects and UK projects and investment on trying to get a better efficiencies and, and networks for hydrogen production and storage as well as part of the technology moving on. So, um, Tom, I don't know if you want to add anything else, like a closing statement before I pass it back to Tapis to, to round out. Well, I th if I could summarise it, the case for hydrogen is evidence weak. Okay, so um, thanks Tom again for, well, from my point of view, thanks a lot for, for the time you've taken to organise this, to, to put together a presentation and, and bring us your ideas here today. I'm going to say goodbye as well to you and, and to the rest of, of the attendance. Thanks for your questions, everyone in the audience. and. I think the, the slides will be made available later on, as Tavis mentioned before. I'm going to leave the floor again to Tavis to, for a for a final comment, and and that's it for me. Okay, thank you everybody for attending this, and 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 my my sincere thanks to to Tom uh, for a, a really thought provoking. Uh, seminar about about hydrogen and the alternatives. I think it's really important that with a lot of the the policy development, a lot of the investment, a lot of the hype that we actually, as a university and, and through the Center for Energy Transition, we we challenge some of these ideas and we explore we challenge some of the sacred cows uh, in our discussions about the options. And Tom, I thought. You know, from some of the work that we also do around a just transition and and jobs and green jobs in the in the in the recovery, you raise some really really interesting points about the sort of the politics and the political economy of hydrogen and, and what can create jobs very fast for communities and, and communities around the UK. 
So I think it was a fascinating talk. Now, just for our audience out there, uh, we have recorded this talk, and this talk will be available as are all of our uh, Centre for Energy Transition and Schools Talks on Energy Transition topics. You can find those talks on abdn.ac.uk slash energy and you can see the library of talks that we have up there for, for, for your own viewing uh, pleasure. So thank you very much everybody for attending this great talk today. A lot to think about. Uh, to go forward. Thank you, Alf, for being uh, also a, a thoughtful and provocative host uh, as well. So uh, I really enjoyed the, the session today and a great way uh, toward, to end the week on. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Alf. And we'll see you next time for our next talks. Coming up in early March, we're planning a double-headed session with the CET and the Global Energy Institute and Curtin University looking at energy transition economics. So please stay tuned on our website for those up and coming talks as well. And we look forward to seeing you at our events going forward. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great weekend.